We are living in a time when we are better connected than ever before. And as soon as something happens anywhere in the world, we know about it straight away. But with so much information at our fingertips, it can be hard to sift out the really important from the superficial. For many people, the Bible seems a bit outdated, boring, or just plain hard to understand. What can the Bible possibly say to us in the 21st century? Definitely. I mean, people quote it often. There's so much like references to it, so it's kind of good to at least like know a little bit about it. It influences people's actions, so yes. To someone, and that's good for them. I don't know, I haven't read the Bible in a long time. For me, the Bible itself has never been super relevant. A little bit of it's outdated. I see the Bible as like a piece of history. The Ten Commandments, probably a lot of them are still very relevant. For the people who use it for good, I think that it is relevant. The Golden Rule, I would assume, is pretty relevant. Like if you read like Proverbs or like Psalms, there's a lot of wisdom in it. Basically, it's instruction for daily living. It leads you to be your best self, then that's lovely and wonderful. Can be, cannot, no. it's up to you. I mean, anything can be applicable and anything can be relatable, but it's not necessarily true. Not all things because the world changes every day. Yeah, because everything that's happening then is still happening now. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's uh, more relevant than ever. It's very much relevant. We just got people who, uh, who need to read it. In the 18th century, the French philosopher Voltaire predicted that the Bible would become a museum piece within 100 years of his lifetime and replaced by more advanced philosophies. But today, the Bible remains the most popular book in the world, the most successful literary creation of all time. Each year, over 100 million Bibles are sold or given away. The YouVersion Bible app has been downloaded over 200 million times. The Bible is the best-selling book of the year, every year. In fact, it's so popular that it's excluded from weekly bestseller lists. The Bible would be the top seller every single week, week in, week out. Many people would say that the Bible is the most popular book of all time because it's also the most powerful. It has the power to change individuals and to change societies. On her coronation day, the Queen of England was handed a Bible with the words, we present you with this book, the most valuable thing that this world affords. The Bible is incredibly precious. The writer of the Psalms describes the Bible as being more precious than gold. In fact, it's so precious that some have even risked their lives to share it with others. It was in um, March 2009 that one day early in the morning, Marzi received a phone call from a stranger. He had some question about the car document and asked her to go to the police station. And we didn't know why and what, what was going to happen. Um, but we just prayed together and she left. She went to the police station and I was waiting for Marzia to return from the security police. Suddenly I heard the sound of her with a few others behind the door. Well, I saw her standing there with um, three guards. And I was so shocked when they ransacked everywhere and they took both of us with all our belongings, like Bibles, Jesus movies, into the security police. We had long hours of interrogation. I, I believe it was in the first day that he threatened us to physical torture. In that dark cell in the basement, we just hugged each other. We said goodbye because we thought it was our last day on earth. And, um, we were so scared. I remember the only thing that we could do um, in that dark cell in those moments was just praying for each other. Uh, we met each other for the first time. It was 2005. And after finishing our theology courses, uh, we both felt that we had the same passion about our country to return to our country and to share this message with our people. That's why even though we knew that how much is dangerous, we decided to go. And we uh, called our pastor, he was in uh, London, and we asked him to send uh, thousands of uh, Bibles. And uh, it wasn't easy for them. And we received uh, those New Testaments and we started our first mission and usually at night we carried about 140 New Testaments in our uh, backpack and put them in the uh, mailboxes. I remember sometimes it was uh, during the winter, we had to walk 
for long hours, for about eight, nine hours. And after almost three years, uh, we could distribute it, uh, 20,000 uh, new testaments. There are some stories, amazing stories, that how God protected us and we could see his miracles. We were distributing Bibles, we were talking to people, and we were having these two house churches in our own apartment and we knew that it was risky. We spent almost nine months in prison and 14 days we were separated. We were um, staying in solitary confinement. And I can say uh, during those nine months, we had almost about 10 trials, 10 courts. And in each court, the judges our, and our interrogators would threaten us to execution by hanging. And they, they wanted to put pressure on us to deny our faith in Jesus. We didn't have Bible with us, but uh, we learned how to live with the verses uh, of Bible. And every day we were praying and uh, asking God to give us uh, this power to live uh, those verses and to show him through, those, uh, uh, through our behaviors to prisoners. It was um, almost uh, uh, at the nine months that uh, uh, we heard that uh, we have we had many supports from different uh, parts of the world, and because of all these uh, supports, the the government had to release us, unlike their desires. And you know, Marzi mentioned about those Bibles that we were distributing. At that time, we were just praying for those Bibles. We did we didn't know who would get those Bibles, and. I remember uh, it was two years ago, we were in Australia and we were invited to a church. We, after our speech, um, a couple came up uh, on the stage and then they were, uh, both of them, they were crying and they started to share their stories. They said that um, the wife found one of those Bibles that we put on the, in their mailboxes and they found the Bible and the whole family came to Christ just by reading that um, New Testament that we put in their mailboxes. The Bible is inspired by God. The Apostle Paul writes, all scripture is inspired by God. The word he uses there, literal translation of the Greek word, is God-breathed. All scripture is God-breathed. Why do I believe that the Bible is inspired by God? Well, to put it simply, and this is an oversimplification, it claims to be, it seems to be, and it proves to be. It claims to be, that this is an example, Paul says, all scripture is inspired by God. It seems to be, when you read it, it has the ring of truth, and it proves to be. I've found that in my life, as I've put it into practice, as I've read it, it, I've sensed God speaking to me through it. And I'd encourage you to do the same. Try it out, and you'll find it proves to be the word of God. Pope Francis, in his letter, Evangelii Gaudium, the joy of the gospel, encourages everyone to study the Bible for themselves. He says, we do not blindly seek God or wait for him to speak to us first, for God has already spoken. And there is nothing further we need to know which has not been revealed to us. Let us receive the sublime treasure of the revealed word. Over a period of 1600 years, the Bible was written by at least 40 authors, kings, scholars, poor people, philosophers, fishermen, poets, statesmen, historians, teachers, prophets, doctors. They wrote different types of literature, such as history, poetry, prophecy, and letters. So the Bible is 100% the work of human authors, but it's also 100% inspired by God. How can that be? St. Paul's Cathedral in London was built by Sir Christopher Wren, the greatest English architect of his time. Construction started in 1675 when he was 43 years old and continued under his direction for 36 years. It was completed in 1711 when he was 79 years of age. Now while Christopher Wren built St. Paul's Cathedral, he didn't actually lay a single stone. There were many people involved, stonemasons, carpenters, laborers and artists. But Sir Christopher Wren was the inspiration behind it all. With the Bible, there are many different writers, but one architect, one inspiration behind it all, God himself. That doesn't mean that there are no difficulties. The Apostle Peter, talking about some of Paul's letters, says there are some things in them that I find really hard to understand. Of course, there are many difficulties in the Bible. Moral and historical difficulties, and apparent contradictions. And if you've ever tried to read the Old Testament, you know that there are some shocking things that happened. 
And you might think, well, how can that be inspired by God? It's a bit like suffering and the love of God. At the heart of Christianity is the love of God. But then you look at the world and you see this massive amount of suffering and you think, how can you hold together the love of God and suffering in the world? It's not easy. And similarly, how can you hold together the inspiration of Scripture and the difficult stuff that we come across in the Bible? Some of these contradictions can be overcome by understanding the type of literature that you're reading and the context that it was written in. And Jesus is the key to interpreting what we read. Jesus is love. He's the supreme revelation of God. If we want to know what God is like, he is like Jesus. And what I've found is that the more you trust that the Bible is inspired by God, the more you understand. The primary way in which God communicates with us is through the Bible. It's his revelation. Sometimes people say, well, if there's a God, why doesn't he show himself? Why doesn't he reveal himself? The answer is, he has. First of all, God has revealed himself through creation. The psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. It's like when you go out on a mountain and you look out at the beauty of creation, the magnificence, the stunning scenes that you see. You say, wow, there's got to be a God. Or you look out at the sky at night and you see all the stars and you say, someone must have created all this. The very fact that we're here, the fact that there is something rather than nothing points to a creator. The fine-tuning of the universe, surely only God could have done that. The fact that we're created with this longing for something more, a longing for God. So yes, God has revealed himself in creation, but supremely, God has revealed himself in a person, in Jesus. But how do we know about Jesus? The main way we know is through the Bible. The New Testament is obviously about Jesus. But the Old Testament also, once you begin to look at it through the lens of Jesus, you see that too is all about a person, the person of Jesus. So science is the exploration of the way in which God has revealed himself through creation. That's why science is so important. It's so amazing. It's so exciting. And theology is an exploration of how God has revealed himself in Jesus and in the Bible. So there should be no conflict between science and faith. There's a widespread impression in the public that science and God don't mix. And that's curious because if you think of the rise of science in the 16th and 17th centuries, all its pioneers believed in God. In fact, they were Christian in some sense or other. You talk about Galileo, Kepler, Newton, and so on. Kepler famously said, we're thinking God's thoughts after him. So far from their belief in God hindering their science, it was the very motive that drove it. Because they believed in a creator, a rational spirit behind the universe, they thought that science was worth doing, and so they did it. So I'm not remotely embarrassed at saying I'm both a scientist and a Christian because arguably Christianity gave me my subject. We study God's revelation both in the natural world and in scripture with the minds that God has given us. And I believe there's no conflict ultimately between those two sides properly understood. It's clear from the Gospels that Jesus viewed the scripture in the Old Testament as inspired by God. For him, what the scripture said, God said. And this is a view held almost universally by the worldwide church through the ages, that the Bible is inspired. It's our authority on how to live. St. Paul says the Bible is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. The Bible is full of practical wisdom and principles for relationships, how to love and forgive others, and advice on healthy living, working, bringing up children, taking care of the elderly relatives and that kind of thing. It gives us boundaries and guidelines to help us get the most out of life. 
And you might think, well, that just sounds like a rule book. It'll take away all my freedom. But actually, we all need boundaries. Imagine if sports had no boundaries or guidelines. They'd be impossible to play, and they'd be quite confusing to watch. Well, in a tricky green it is, Bill. Knoodles really got to get back on track here after bogeying the 14th. He looks like he's ready to make a shot. Oh, smart move. Another smart move by Knoodle. He's really rounded out his short game. Well, these two athletes are so evenly matched here. Jeffries jumps in right away, establishing control. Whoa! Hey, I thought we might see something like this. This team is known for these shrewd kind of tactics. If there were no boundaries or guidelines in life, then our lives would be utter chaos. God has given us guidelines for how to live, not because he hates us or wants us to be miserable, but because he loves us and he wants us to enjoy life to the full. True freedom actually comes from when we know that God is in control and that there are boundaries. Yeah, so we know that children who grow up without boundaries are insecure, they're unhappy. And it's the same with us. Actually, the boundaries are given out of love. God didn't say, you shall not murder because he wanted to ruin our fun. He didn't say, don't commit adultery because he's a spoil sport. He doesn't want people to get hurt. He loves you. Through the Bible, God has spoken. But also, through the Bible, God still speaks. The Bible has been described as a love letter from God. When you receive a letter from someone you love, you keep the letter. I've kept every single letter that my wife Pippa has ever written to me. Not because the letters are important, but because of the person who wrote it. And Jesus said this, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. And the Bible is a communication from the person we love. If you like, it's a love letter from God. And that's what makes it so exciting to read. Jesus makes this point that the purpose of the Bible is not just to study the Bible for itself, but the purpose of the Bible is to bring us into a relationship with Jesus Christ. He says, the whole purpose of this book is to bring you into a relationship. And that relationship is what matters. I had a friend named Earl Smith. Everyone in his family was wealthy. Earl was so rich, he didn't need to work. And instead, he started taking drugs. He took such hard drugs that he ended up in hospital at the age of 30. Someone came to visit him and gave him a gift, a copy of the New Testament. Earl was thrilled because he realized that the pages of his new Bible were perfect for rolling joints. And he rolled his way through Matthew, Mark, Luke. And when he got to John's Gospel, he finally started reading. After reading John's Gospel, Earl came to faith in Jesus Christ. And his life was never the same again. It affected everything in him and everyone around him, including his psychologist, a beautiful doctor named Tommy. She couldn't understand it. I don't understand it, she said to Earl. I have everything, a great job, money, family, friends, and yet inside I feel totally empty. Meanwhile, your life is a complete mess, and you still have this extraordinary peace about you. So Earl told her all that he'd read in the Bible. He explained what it felt like to be loved by Jesus Christ. Earl led Tommy to know Jesus. And then he married her. Earl and I trained together at Theological College. God is longing to communicate with us, to be in a relationship with us. At the end of John's Gospel, it says, These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life. So the best way to invest in this relationship and to hear from God and to know Jesus is through reading the Bible. It's easy to be overly ambitious. Like you'll say, I'm gonna read a book of the Bible every day for an hour. Now that is ambitious. Or thinking of squeezing it in at the wrong time. Oh. 
So, for example, you could take 10 minutes in the morning, make some breakfast and then read a few verses. And then you need to find a place where you won't be distracted. The most important thing you need is a plan. Decide what you're going to read. I suggest starting with one of the Gospels, the four books about Jesus' life in the New Testament. Or you could download a Bible reading plan like the Bible in one year. There are many ways to read the Bible. You just need to find one that works for you. And just keep it very simple. Read a few verses, pray, and ask God to speak to you. And then think about what the verses mean to you. What do they say about God's character? What encouragement can you take from it? How does it guide you in life's choices? What might God be asking you to do differently? And how can you put it all into practice? And don't worry if you come across difficulties or bits that you don't really understand. I found it's a bit like a crossword puzzle. You start with a clue and sometimes you come across one that you can't really answer. But you don't stop. You move on to the next clue and maybe that's a bit easier and then you start to fill in a few of the clues and that gives you the letters that help you to understand the more difficult ones. And I found it's a bit like that with the Bible. I wrestle with all this stuff and the more I wrestle with it, the more I begin to understand other bits that I'm reading. And if you expect God to speak to you through the Bible, then he will. It's exciting to know God and to communicate with him in that way. Over the last 40 years that I've been a Christian, I've read the Bible practically every day. Not because I feel I have to, it's because I love it. It's like, why do I eat breakfast every day? Because I like it. To me, not reading the Bible, it's like skipping a meal. Because the Bible to me is spiritual food. And I, I want to encourage you to develop a regular pattern of reading the Bible each day and praying that God would speak to you. It's an amazing experience when he does. I think back, for example, to when my father died in 1981. My parents, when, when I became Christian, they were, they were, neither of them were churchgoers and they were a bit worried about it. My mother eventually became a committed Christian, but my father really was always a bit um, cautious, I would say, about my faith and never certainly gave any indication that he had a faith. And so when he died, I, of course, I missed him. It was, I was very shocked by his death. But, but for me, there was an added ingredient. I was concerned about whether he, he had a faith or not, whether he was a Christian. And about 10 days after he died, I was reading the Bible, and, and I sensed God speaking to me through a verse. And it was in Romans 10, 13, which says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And I sense God saying to me through that verse, your father did call on me and he was saved. And that was so reassuring. But at that moment, Pippa, my wife, came into the room and she said, I've just been reading a verse which I think is for your father. It's from Acts 2.21. And it says this, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It was quite extraordinary because that verse only appears twice in the New Testament. She'd read it in one part, I read it in another. And then three days later, we went to this small group where we were studying the Bible and we happened to be studying Romans 10. Particularly, we were looking at verse 13. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So like I say, three times in three days, God seemed to have spoken to me through that same verse. But such was my lack of faith that the next morning as I was going to work, I was still worrying about that, that question. And as I got out of the underground, I looked up and there was, on the station, there was this huge great billboard. And on it, it said, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans 10, 13. I remember saying to a, a friend, telling him the story about what had happened. And he said to me, do you think the Lord may be trying to speak to you? Let me ask you a question. Do you think the Lord may be trying to speak to you? And if so, will you let him? <laughs>